When it comes to the representation of music artists in cinema, only a few superstars get to have biopics made about their life. Even fewer are those who get to handpick who will embody them on screen. It's the case of Aretha Franklin who, in a famous interview with Wendy Williams, had a rather clear idea of who could play her in a movie. You thought that Halle Berry would be great playing you, and Halle said something to the effect of, mm -hmm. I can't sing, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do Miss Franklin justice. I knew she couldn't sing. Yes. Um, I never expected her to, and she was uh, uh, my cho uh, first choice, but not my only choice. Yeah. I think that Jennifer Hudson mm -hmm. would do a bang up job as okay. you. She has a good clear voice. A good clear voice. Mm -hmm. Then how about Fantasia Barino? Could be Fantasia, could be uh, Jennifer. Queen Latifah? You don't know. Her dream finally came true three years after her passing when a movie about her with Jennifer Hudson starring in the lead role was released. In general, there's always a sense of anticipation surrounding the release of music biopics, and this time was no exception, as many fans were eager to discover how the Queen of Soul would be portrayed on the big screen. As a huge Aretha Franklin fan myself, I made it a point to watch it once it would be available on streaming platforms. Needless to say that I had quite a few expectations before watching the movie and even more thoughts after. Indeed, making a successful music biopic has a lot to do with managing expectations. After all, Aretha Franklin fans already know major biographical elements about her as well as her discography. But it's always possible to surprise a knowledgeable audience thanks to an innovative cast, good dialogues, and the addition of fictional elements. I'm in no way an expert on Aretha Franklin's life, but I thought it would be interesting to make a video to present my thoughts, positive and negative, about the movie. So without further ado, here are my thoughts. As said previously, Aretha Franklin is played in the movie by Jennifer Hudson. She actually does a very good job at playing Aretha and singing her most famous songs. Over the years, a lot of actors playing in music biopics have been evaluated based on their capacity to precisely mimic their model's demeanor. But here, Jennifer Hudson avoids imitation by delicately fusing Aretha Franklin's aura with her own and recognizing how much she owes to her lineage. Her reverence for Aretha is evident and can be seen in the way she delivers her words. She can't really come close to embodying the richness, range, and refinement of Aretha's style, which could equally express vigor and panache. Now every road I walk, I walk along with you, no one, no one I get so. as well as warmth, delicacy, and vulnerability. Still, her overall performance is believable and heartfelt, but doesn't hide the fact that the story contains a lot of the cliches that are typical of music biopics. In fact, the movie's plot comes in a pre-packaged format, abiding by all the codes of the subgenre. Start by showing the artist's experienced childhood trauma, and then being hunted by them well into their adult life, check. Insert countless reenactments of their most iconic moments, check. Feature plenty of other famous names. Hey, Ray. Hey, Uncle Sam. Nope. I see an old family friend, Dinah Washington. The Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Angela Davis must go free. Check. Finally, finish with a lengthy postscript detailing all the artist's achievements that were not seen in the movie while assuming that the viewer knows little to nothing about them. Check. As far as the storyline itself is concerned, Kelly Curry and Tracy Scott Wilson did a pretty good job at framing Aretha Franklin's life to adapt it into a movie. 
The film embarks us on a journey through the earliest years of Aretha Franklin's life, spanning 20 years from 1952 to 1972. That choice is reasonable for a film adaptation, since making a cradle-to-grave biopic would have made it nearly impossible to address any part of her life in depth. The movie intelligently takes us to all corners of the United States, from her childhood in Detroit to her Columbia years in New York, her transition to another label in Alabama, and finally the recording of her best-selling album Amazing Grace in Los Angeles, California. It follows a convenient two-act structure that first sees Aretha find herself as an artist and then as a person. We first meet little Re as a child, played by a terrific young actress named Sky Dakota Turner, as her preacher father, C.L. Franklin, wakes her up in the middle of the night. She walks into a house party attended by members of the black cultural elite. She sings My Baby Likes to Bebop by Ella Fitzgerald in front of an audience that already recognizes her talent. But there's also this latent feeling that Aretha is her father's pawn and doesn't fully own her voice. After experiencing some major personal trauma that I will not spoil here, she completely stops speaking for a long period of time before singing again in her father's church. Aretha struggles to assert herself while her domineering father attempts to control her. She ultimately marries the unscrupulous Ted White, who becomes her manager but also tries to control her, just like her father did. After years of struggles to achieve a hit record, she takes a risk on working with hungry record producer Jerry Wexler, who urges her to move away from gentle classics and towards more passionate, soul-infused songs. Songs. Wexler is the one that assisted Franklin in discovering her true voice. As a result of her collaboration with a group of brilliant white musicians from the South, respect comes to life, just like Aretha, who has now found her voice as an artist and uses her talent with purpose. It is the movie's first empowering musical moment and allows Aretha, who until then was objectified through the eyes of her father and eroticized through the eyes of her husband, to momentarily detach herself from the male gaze. Overall, the first act is a proper introduction to Aretha, but it downplays the level of agency she had as an artist in a resolute endeavor to emphasize her personal struggles and to characterize her father as an overbearing patriarch. Though her father can be seen offering her a plane ticket to New York, several sources have claimed that it is indeed Aretha herself who made the decision to move from Detroit to New York to pursue a career as a blues singer, even though her father was initially not keen on the idea. Likewise, it's not her father, but one of his friends, Mule Holy, who brought Aretha to New York and got her signed to Columbia. In addition, the cause of her failure to get a hit at the beginning of her career remains fairly ambiguous in the film. Her early lack of success had as much to do with her traumatic personal problems, which are extensively addressed in the film, as it had to do with Colombia's indecisiveness as to how to market her, the lack of definition of a target audience for her, and the fact that she was usually told to mimic the style of other successful artists while she was at the label. Finally, though the movie hints at the variety of influences Aretha drew from, her inspiration as a vocalist and an artist remains obscure. Aretha grew up in the church and was therefore first introduced to gospel music. When she became a teenager, her interest shifted towards jazz and blues and she fell in love with her idol. There's only one heaven, one earth, and one queen. Me, Dinah Washington. Dinah Washington was part of the previous generation of singers who rose to prominence in the 40s and 50s and she enjoyed nationwide fame during her prime. As a matter of fact, her career and style were used as a template by Aretha Franklin at the very beginning of her career. Unfortunately, Aretha's early years at Columbia were difficult, in great part due to the fact that the label did not find the right way to market her from the get-go. If you listen to her earliest records, you'll see that she takes inspiration from her idol, Dinah Washington, and her album, Songs of Faith, sounds almost like a tribute to Mahalia Jackson. Despite her focus on emulating others when she started her career, Aretha quickly realized that the music landscape was radically changed in the mid-60s as the Beatle mania, soul, and black pop music mainly represented by John Warwick and the Supremes 
took radios by storm. Her hit Respect, released in 1967, was as much a feminist anthem as a unique contribution to the transformation of popular music that occurred during that decade. Her demand for respect as a black woman was also culturally significant given that it coincided with both the emergence of the civil rights movement and the rise of second wave feminism in the United States. In the film, once she's found success and has become the queen of soul, she keeps struggling with alcoholism and strives to free herself from an abusive relationship. The second act tells how she eventually overcame her quote-unquote demons and recorded her best-selling album Amazing Grace in a very successful attempt to go back to her gospel roots and heal broken relationships she had with her relatives. As you probably understood by now, Aretha Franklin was a music giant. So telling her story in a film is definitely a daunting task. Some of the most visible choices made in the movie might appear surprising, like the decision to have Jennifer Hudson play Aretha Franklin from age 17 and up. Maybe it is meant to express the idea that as the daughter of a renowned preacher and an activist in the civil rights movement since her teenage years, she was symbolically thrown into adulthood as she had to endorse heavy responsibilities at a very young age. The film rightfully addresses many fundamental aspects of Aretha Franklin's life and career. Her initial failure to stand out in the music landscape, the domestic abuse she faced in her marriage, and most importantly, her struggle for control and ownership, which shapes power dynamics among characters throughout the story. But unfortunately, the narrative techniques used prevent the film from addressing those crucial topics in a way that could truly move the audience. One of the main principles of cinematography is show, don't tell, which allows the viewer to experience the story through action, thoughts, senses, and feelings, rather than through description. But here, the principle is converted to tell, don't show, as some character lines plainly reveal key elements about Aretha. We are told that she is a struggling artist at the beginning of her career. How many albums have you had? Oh. And no hits. Similarly, we are also told what makes Aretha a unique artist. Right now, gospel is the main influence on contemporary rhythm and blues. And that's due to Aretha. As far as its ideological underpinnings, the film adopts a clearly feminist stance, but the ideological framework isn't developed enough, giving the impression that Aretha could seamlessly challenge white-dominated and patriarchal spaces by gently asking for respect and recognition. I'd like you to call me Miss Franklin. Okay, Miss Franklin. By contrast, some might find it difficult to grapple with the racialized dimension of the oppression Aretha suffers, while the weight of white male-dominated institutions and the resulting difficulty she had to navigate them as a black woman are not extensively shown on screen. Though the information presented in the movie is for the most part accurate, we can't help but think that depicting the Queen of Soul as first a child of trauma who rises up to become the lauded Queen of Soul and second, the alcoholic who subdues her addiction in order to record her best-selling album is somewhat reductive. The film strives to interweave Aretha Franklin's personal, political, and professional lives, but it takes a method that reduces significant moments to stops in her biography. Whether it's witnessing her come up with a whole new arrangement for Otis Redding's Respect, or hearing her eulogize Martin Luther King in song after his death, the film rarely delves into these pivotal moments to get a feel of the person shaped by them. For instance, much is made about her public expression of support for Angela Davis, so when her management team calls her for a press conference in the following scene, we presume it's to deal with the consequences of that declaration. But as it turns out, their cancelling shows due to previously unknown difficulties and the Angela Davis subplot is not further developed. 
Once again, an opportunity to dive into a significant and intriguing issue was squandered. Tim Grierson writes, quote, Jennifer Hudson is also hindered by a screenplay that frequently views Franklin more as an inspirational figure than a multi-layered person. That impulse to lionize, while laudable, flattens Franklin's fascinating quirks and sizable ambition, stripping her of what made her such a compelling, complicated artist. End quote. In a nutshell, the movie struggles to define Aretha outside the events that contributed to her fame and the men that contributed to her pain. It simplifies the connection between Aretha's life and career by viewing her alternatively as a larger-than-life presence and a tormented victim. In between, we find scenes that attempt to give the character more depth but don't do so extensively enough to generate a sense of satisfaction. Despite the points of criticism expressed previously, I do think that the movie is worth watching. Most musical moments are brilliantly carried by Jennifer Hudson with beautiful cinematography, highlighting how Aretha Franklin's music resonated with the public. Each performance is used to tell Aretha's story, underscoring her capacity to turn any song into something that is not only highly personal, but also highly highly relatable. There's also some pretty amazing live singing, and it's also interesting to see the effort made to channel her diva persona and style through costume design. The great gowns, beautiful gowns. But if, like me, you're particularly interested in her Amazing Grace era, you'll be better off watching the documentary made about it back in 2018. In the end, a lot of the problems mentioned here have to do with the nature and format of the music biopic, which was followed diligently by the team working on the movie. It remains valuable because it's a family-friendly film that would be great to introduce a new generation to Aretha Franklin and potentially make people interested in reading one of her biographies or watching a documentary about her. But we should not give directors an A+, for merely attempting to depict the lives of figures such as Aretha Franklin. On the contrary, because it is so rare to see those people's lives in movies, we should be all the more critical of the way they are represented. The reason that we care so much is not because those figures are idols that should not be taken off their pedestals, but because their timeless songs and their stories of courage, dedication, and triumph over adversity are invaluable, profoundly inspiring, and dear to our hearts.